A native of South St. Paul, Tim Palenti grew up the son of a truck driver and a homemaker. Like many proud Augies sitting here today, he worked alongside his college studies and became the first in his family to graduate. Receiving a BA degree in political science from the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts and a JD from the University of Minnesota Law School. The governor's distinguished career in public service has been shaped by passionate beliefs in an American freedom which allows ordinary people to do extraordinary things, in the power of public debate, and in the strength that comes from the expression of differing opinions. His two terms as Minnesota's governor have been marked by commitments to innovation and fiscal responsibility. As Republicans look ahead to a new generation of leadership, the entire country has taken notice of his accomplishments. Governor Pawlenty, we are honored to have you at Augsburg College today as we honor our commitment to civic engagement and celebrate our students' achievements. Please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker, the Honorable Tim Pawlenty, Governor of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, um, I'm speaking only for the second time as my eight years as governor at a commencement address. I don't normally accept these invitations because I think it's a time for celebration and reflection and family and all of the values that you're here today to celebrate and all of the accomplishments that you're celebrating. And I always think, oh, who wants to listen to a politician at these things anyhow? And I want to just tell you up front, I'm not giving any policy or political talk today. I just want to share with you a, a few, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But in the spirit of this gathering, I wanted to come and just share with you a few lessons or insights I've learned about life along the way. And uh, I hope that you'll find them valuable. And I want to just first of all say to the soon-to-be graduates, congratulations to each and every one of you. Uh, your presence here today and receiving this diploma is a ceremonial taking of a document, but it means a lot more. It means hard work. It means a commitment to a goal. It means aspirations for the future. It also means that you now have some skills and some abilities that you didn't have four or hopefully no more than four years ago, but a few, some years ago that you can apply for broader purposes. As was mentioned during the introduction, I grew up in the meatpacking town of South St. Paul. I was the only one in my family able to go to college. I understood that education was a pathway to some opportunities, but only a pathway. You've got to walk the path. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. And so I just congratulate you on your educational accomplishment. But now I'd like to challenge you to think about what's next and what to do with that. I'm very glad uh, that Augsburg College still holds out itself as a values-based, uh, faith-based organization. And I share that with you because um, the founding document of the state of Minnesota, our constitution, in the very first sentence, of the very first paragraph of the Minnesota Constitution says this, we the people of Minnesota, grateful to God for our civil and religious liberties. And then it goes on from there to talk about the importance of passing on that perspective and those blessings to the generations that are to come. And the first insight or thought I wanna share with you this morning, and just, it's just a few and I won't go through them uh, in great length, but the first one is, Gratitude smooths over a lot of things. You know, life is busy. People get very anxious. They can get very hectic. They can get their priorities kind of jumbled up. And if you see common uh, elements in today's modern life, one of them is busyness. One is a sense of too many things to do and not enough time to do it. Having a sense of gratitude for what we do have brings a sense of tranquility and peace to individuals and more broadly. And I know as a state and as a nation and as a world, we have big, big challenges. We have big things to confront that are unjust, that are matters of resource allocation, that are matters of poverty and many, many other challenges. And we need to do all that we can to address them. And there will be more of those in the future for sure. But let's also not lose sight of gratitude for what we do have. We live in the freest and most prosperous nation in the history of the world. There are no people anywhere ever, anywhere in the history of, of mankind that have had the good fortune of living in a more prosperous, more free nation in the United States of America. And so stepping back from the day-to-day -day challenges and appreciating that brings a sense of gratitude. And we also, I think, need to remain grateful for where it all begins and ends, and that's with God and in our faith. 
And so I rely on the uh, passage of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. And so as you think about compass settings for life, what you want to aim for, what you want to rely on, what your foundations are, I hope that the value system that you learned here or had expanded here, were exposed here at Augsburg, is something that you'll rely on to go forward. I think it'll serve you well as you're looking for life's compass settings and life's foundations. And then lastly, I want to just share with you one other example of gratitude reflected or personified in, in an act of service. There's lots of different ways to serve, but one way to serve is in our United States military. I was in Afghanistan uh, last year and I've been there a couple other times in that region. I had a chance to meet with the United States Marine who was down in Kandahar area. and He was uh, coming through Kabul where I was and I had a chance to have a cup of coffee with him and a meal. And I said, how's it going? He said, Governor, uh, it's really tough. He said, every day we are in a firefight. We're living in tents if we even have a tent. The food isn't very good. We don't have access to showers. You don't know at the beginning of the day whether you're going to make it through the day or not. And I said, well, how does that make you feel? He said, first of all, I'm just very grateful to be here in Kabul. We got a shower and a hot meal. But he said, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful to be representing and serving my country, the United States of America. And he had an attitude of, you know, it is tough, it is challenging, but he was grateful for what he had and for what he was doing. Second thing I wanted to just share with you is something I picked up when I graduated at, or at the law school at the University of Minnesota. I had a professor there, Steve Block was his name. Uh, he was my first year civil procedure professor. At the end of the year, uh, he called us together at the last day of class and he said, now you're trained, now you're educated, now you're skilled. In many of life's settings, you're going to be some of the smartest people in the room. You're going to be able to use your knowledge, your skill, your debating ability to do uh, all kinds of things. But he said there's a downside to it. And then he went on to talk about and read a passage from Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi. And the passage, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, went like this. It talked about that as a young person, Mark Twain and his friends enjoyed all of the natural beauty and wonderment of the river, the Mississippi River. They enjoyed the blue water, they enjoyed the green shores, they played, they had fun. There was a simplicity and an elegance to this simple beauty of life on the Mississippi. And then as he became an adult, he became skilled and trained as a riverboat pilot. And what he got taught was there's all kinds of hazards out there. There's currents, there's bogs, there's navigational hazards that you must avoid and learn about. And he became so uh, engrossed in studying the hazards that he lost sight of the beauty. And he wrote in Mark Twain's uh, in the Mississippi, he said, never again could he look at the river with that natural beauty that he had as a young person. And then Professor Block closed the book and he said, don't let that happen to you. He said, you're skilled and trained lawyers. You're skilled to look for hazards, try to avoid them. But you're going to become so immense in the hassles of the day, the fight of the day, the litigation of the day. Don't lose sight of the simple beauty. When my wife Mary and I go out, uh, yesterday we were out walking our dog Maisie, our little eight-pound uh, multi Shih Tzu Bichon Yorkie uh, um, <laughs> dog, who we love very much. But, Mary and I, it would stop me and she said, look at these lilacs blooming. Look at the apple tree blooming. And it took Maisie and me over to smell. And when she used to do this when we were younger, I'd get very annoyed. I'd like, come on, you know, we only got a half hour for this walk. Time is ticking. You know, I've seen flowers before. Let's just, let's just roll. And she insists that we stop uh, because these only blossom for just a, sh 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 a few short days and weeks and go over and smell. And I used to be annoyed by it. And now I take it in. We looked at those flowers, we smelled those flowers because they're beautiful, they're simple, they're elegant, they bring great joy and they're a gift that comes and goes. So I hope you'll remember that metaphor along the way, the busyness of life, the need to focus on career, all of the hectic things that come. Please stop and, t and enjoy the simple beauty and don't lose sight. And then third, uh, some of you will remember The Purpose Driven Life written by Pastor Rick Warren. He is a, a mega church pastor in California, one of the best-selling books of all time. If you open up that book, 
first page, it says it's not about you. In other words, it's not about us. But he goes on throughout that book to say, God has given each of us, each of you, some skills, some gifts, some abilities. And for different people, it's different things. Some of you are great at math and science and technology. Others of you are great at communication. Others of you may be not you know, extroverts, but introverts, but you're great at friendships and support and love and prayer one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Others of you may just have the gift of, of building or thinking or designing or inventing and down the list. The question is, doesn't, uh, isn't whether you all have gifts that you can use. The question is, what are you going to use them for? And Rick's call, Pastor Warren's call is, uh, are you willing to dedicate some portion of who you are, what you are, what you've been given, what you have to a cause or a purpose greater than just your individual circumstance? And I think the ethic of this institution, Augsburg College, answers that question by saying yes they prepare you and elevate that ethic up and say, this is important. It's in you now. You've learned it. It's available to you. And I hope that you will take full advantage of that. I've had the sad occasion as governor to go to dozens and dozens and dozens of funerals. I try to go to every funeral of every fallen soldier. I try to see all the firefighters and police officers who are killed in the line of duty and many others. And I can tell you, I have never been to a funeral where friends and family and loved ones stand up and say, oh, we're going to miss uh, Sally because she had that great big BMW. Or, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to miss Henry because he had that great house, you know, out on the lake with the big boat. What they say is, this is a person of faith that we're going to miss him or her. Was it, wasn't he a person of a great friendship of character, of service. Didn't he help us out in our time of need? Wasn't he generous? Wasn't he kind? And they talk about not the here and the now and the money, but the values and character and commitment to service of the person. And then lastly, I just would suggest to you, character matters and show up at key events. Um, you can spend your whole lifetime or all your energy, a lot of it, building up a reputation. And you can lose it all in a minute. In a minute of bad judgment, in a bit minute of... And none of us are perfect. Believe me, I've made lots of mistakes. Um, everybody in this room has made mistakes along the way. So you'll make some. Uh, but the question isn't, isn't, isn't whether you're going to make some mistakes. The question is how do you deal with adversity? And in that adversity, your character will be revealed. It was Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, who said that hardship doesn't create character, but it reveals it. So curveballs of life will come. For some of you, it'll be money. For some of you, it may be addiction. For some of you, it may be a health challenge or concern. For some of you, it may be a family tragedy. There is no doubt that in some chapter of your life, you will face adversity. And the question for each of you will come, not whether it'll come, but how do you respond to it? And your character will be revealed in that moment. And so please uh, pay attention to your character and celebrate those things that matter. Our culture focuses so much on loudness, on entertainment, on recreation, on fame, on money. And really, that isn't where character is found. Some of those pursuits are fun and interesting, you know, the appropriate ones. but. Uh, <laughs> But that isn't where character is revealed. And think about the, what's in the news lately. Think about Bernie Madoff. Think about Tom Petters. You know, spent a lifetime chasing a shallow, hollow, fake, uh, lacking in integrity set of pursuits that now put him in prison. And there's many, many other examples of that. And then show up at key events. This is a small one, but it's a big one, really. When you think about life, you get real busy and people along the way are going to have weddings, anniversaries, funerals and things. And you may say, well, you know, I'm just one more person in the crowd. What difference does it make if I'm at, at that event? It makes a lot of difference. And in those moments where people celebrate the most or need you the most, if you are their true friend, you will be there uh, with them. Uh, lastly, just close with this. Life is not a sprint. It's a relay race. And as Paul talked to Timothy, um, of course, my pastor, by the way, reminds me when I first was inaugurated as governor, he read from 1 Timothy. During my second inaugural, he read from uh, 2 Timothy. 
And at the end of my second inaugural, he said, and remember, there's no third Timothy. Um, <laughs> so my time as governor is shortly coming to an end. I tell people being a politician is like being a house guest. Uh, you need to know when to leave. So, uh, uh, but I want to leave you with this thought. Uh, life is not a sprint. It's a relay race. And so you don't just run down the track and 100 yard dash and hit the tape and say, look at me, look what I did, look at my time. Uh, it is also about making sure that you take what you've been given, what you have, and be willing and able and prepared to pass the baton to those who are coming up behind you. So you are our next generation. You are our leaders, our servant leaders of the future. Your ability to affect change socially, economically, culturally, politically, and down the rest is going to be enormous. You have a tremendous set of skills and abilities and opportunities in front of you. And Herb Brooks, our great uh, Minnesota coach, coached the 1980 Olympics teams. You were too young to remember that, at least in terms of being alive, but, uh, but you'll remember it in history. But he was from the east side of St. Paul. He was a plain-spoken, tough, fair-minded person. And he coached this unlikely set of heroes to the semifinals of the U.S. Hockey Olympics, and they faced the Soviet Union, the world-dominating Soviet Union team in hockey. No one gave the Americans a chance. They were a bunch of basically college kids uh, playing against these world-class pro athletes from the Soviet Union. And what became known as the miracle of ice, of course, the Americans won. But in that locker room before that game, Herb Brooks said this, you were born to be a hockey player, every one of you. You were meant to be here. This is your time. Now go out and get it. You were born to be here in this moment. You have been equipped to be students and servants and leaders. This is your time. After you get this diploma here today, go out and get it. But just make sure it's the right thing for the right reasons with the right values. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this morning. Thank you.